Hello, hello! You are listening to By All Means Necessary, and I am your host, Maya. The truth of the matter is, I have questioned people's stupidity a bit today. I have gone out on the roads, on the streets, into a shopping center to buy myself a pretzel. Very important story for the beginning of this episode. And in doing so, I have questioned people's stupidity as to why did it take us 21 centuries to separate entrances and exits to places? Why did we smack our bodies against one another before this, before a whole pandemic happened? Why couldn't they just separate those before? So I have exerted my brain pondering on this very thought the whole day and I haven't prepared an episode for you. That is a lie. That would be the extreme, (laughs) knowing that my episodes are like long form and, you know, I prepare them weeks in advance. The truth of the matter is that I have exerted most of my powers by researching one of the longest cases. It is on YouTube now. Well, the part one should be by the point of this episode and then the part two should be coming later today. So I will put a link to that below. But what that means is actually one of the funnier twists that I have just thought of, you know, because (laughs) it didn't take me 21 centuries to think about this. Today, for you, exclusively, without any extra charge, I'm going to reverse us all back to January 2020. Stop screaming into your headphones. I'm not going to replay the episode on Robert Picton. Actually, it's going to be kind of even worse than that. It's the most ridiculous thing, and I don't know how I haven't thought about this gem before, but here we are. I'm going to play to you the episode that I have posted on Patreon. Truly a patient zero, really. That led me nowhere, and that is another part why this is funny. On 6th of January 2020, in the first week when episode number one was released on this channel, The episode that I have posted on Patreon is on the case of Kim Rico, and it is the snapped episode that I have analyzed, and it is just the epitome of everything I represented back in the day. I had no idea what I was doing. All of the ums and ahs are in there. There is a background music. I'm still called Motive. Listen. It is there to show us how far we came along. So, without further ado, which is also something I used to say back in the day, enjoy The Patient Zero, episode 1 on Patreon, that was never released to the public until now. Yeah, enjoy and appreciate me some more, huh? How about you follow me on the social media after I put you through this horror that you are about to witness? Um... Bye and see you next week when I will not be exerted and I will be bringing you three completely new cases. Okay, now really, let's listen to this jam. This is your host Maya and this is your extra content. If you're actually here, thank you. You have, you know, decided to spend a fiver, you know, not on a pint or coffee, but actually here with me, listening to an extra episode. So, um... Welcome, and let's just get straight to business. Uh, On Valentine's Day in 1998 in Maryland, USA, Kim Rico poisoned her husband, Stephen Rico, lighting the room on fire to cover up her crime. We know the crime, we have our killer, we have our victim. What was the motive? So the discovery date is Valentine's Day, February the 14th, in 1998. Um, why I'm not covering this on actual Valentine's Day is because I am wild and dangerous like that and I hate that day. Um, but, yep, so um, this is discovery and some aftermath to obviously get into what the police detectives has, have been seeing because in this case it actually plays a great part in the in the motive of what some people, most people actually consider as one. 
So, um, Kim and her husband went to a murder mystery dinner to try and reconnect because their marriage has been struggling, so Steven was keen on saving it. Kim sort of was giving it up one last chance. So they had the argument and have left this murder mystery party. Um, obviously a lot of coverage of this actually focuses on, you know, being the murder mystery party. But don't believe it, because obviously it's just done for dramatic effect. So um, it is just that they have actually attended this party and then um, have argued afterwards and departed. So just um, the discovery was actually done by Kim herself. So they leave the party. She has trouble finding the house upon the return. Um, so this kind of is before GPS, but still, apparently there was like 15 minute distance between the actual party place and the, the house where they were staying, or rather the hotel where they were staying. So she comes back home and yep, yeah, she just walks into the reception and calmly says, uh, my room is on fire. And obviously they're freaking out, they are uh, calling the police. She is still very much calm, um, they're asking her, you know, do you wish to actually inform anybody of this? And she says she doesn't want to call any friends to disturb them. Which again, not what you should be the first reaction if you were trying to play, you know, the innocent card. So the police comes around, um, she gives like sort of a half ass explanation of how Steven got drunk and they got into the argument. And then apparently Steven wanted to have sex, but she didn't. And yeah, because they were working it out and she was like, no, this is the only way yet yeah, that we will work this out as in like, let's not get the emotions twisted, which fair play. I give her that. That's the part where I'm like, okay, not that bad. So they go into the room and um, as it, the police goes into the room and basically you wouldn't even say that the room had been burned. So it's like a very specific area. It's just a bed that has actually being lit on fire. So at first, you know, they think it was caused by a cigarette butt, um, as, you know, they claimed that he, she claimed he was drinking and they could see the cigarettes. Um, and at the first glance, it seems like an apparent accidental death. Um, but, autopsy, oh, I thought he said autoplay. I was like, what? <laughs> autopsy find that no booze was in his system. So um, they ruled out as asphyxiation because as well as, you know, the autopsy found that he didn't have enough smoke in his throat. So he has been dead prior to the murder because otherwise they would have noted that he has actually inhaled the smoke. You know how this goes. You know everything about autopsy and smoke inhalation. Has everybody watched? I think it was called Dr. G on investigation discovery was this anybody else's you know teenagehood i don't want to say childhood but teenagehood and you admired and you probably didn't know how much they actually smell and what they actually see and how they dissect the bodies like they're animals but you loved it you loved it you were tr committed you know to true crime since the very early age so serious business serious business Okay, so sort of the aftermath of this and how the investigation actually went. So the police found a store where the booze was purchased and the booze was apparently purchased by her. Now, if you were like me, you look um, to you know, research on these, you look at different reconstructions of events. So forensic files is this amazing, epically deadly done reconstruction where everything is so serious, but the actual actors it's just, I think like whoever comes to those auditions just gets the part. There's no matter, you don't have to look as a victim. You don't have to look as a perp. You just get the part. You just walk in and that's it. A slight burp. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the forensic files here is hilarious. So the person behind the counter asks him, where does she dye her hair? So she's apparently just, you know, like a normal question, like, hey, I love your dye, where do you get it done? And Kim's basically just goes angry, like kicks off and snaps and says that it's her actual natural hair color, which again, okay, but this is basically why she was memorable to that clerk at the counter, which again, if you are trying to appear normal, casual, you know, not memorable, again, don't snap at like people who will 
clearly be interrogated to remember you. You know, just advice, don't commit crime, but yeah, just some common sense advice. As this investigation progresses, um, Kim demonstrated an unusual quick... What am I saying? Trying to say it in one breath. So Kim actually demonstrates unusual curiosity about the status of the medical examiner's report, which would be great, I would say, if she was from the beginning on this. She's like, it's my husband, I'm like crying, my blowing my eyes out. But she kind of has this sudden interest and it is just about, hey, what did the autopsy say? Hey, what does the medical examiner's report actually say? Slightly, slightly suspicious. So, um, she also raised concerns with her adamant ins insistence, clearly copy-paste, <laughs> clearly. So she was basically um, insisting that Steve's body be cremated, as in apparently that was his last wish. As if, as if this guy was dying and they were actually discussing this. Like they were trying to save the marriage. Why are you suddenly bringing this up and bullshitting that it's the one thing to honor a loved one's last wishes? It's, this guy was not on his deathbed. Um, so... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, and she also asked a close friend to find out what others have been saying to the police. So basically like, hey, the police are interrogating them, let's find out what they have been saying, you know, do the stories in line. Then don't do what you have been doing, which you will find out. Um, she also spoke about Steve's insurance policies. Um, the friend recalled that Kim said that I don't care what anyone says, it wasn't for the money. Again, what wasn't for the money? Um, uh, yeah. Well, what wasn't for the money, lady? Hi, it wasn't for the What wasn't? You, you said you, you're innocent. You said you didn't murder it. So what wasn't for the money? Like the incidental death that happened in the room? Ah, it's beyond me. Okay. Okay, now the police does their magic and this is what actually is the crime. So same day, Valentine's Day, judging by everything is when like he actually died. Um, so according to the police, according to the evidence, she found the room and then before she actually reports the scene of the crime, she knocks Steven out with a drug that's called sort of something like succiny colin yeah, great. Sounds, sounds correct enough. Uh, which is a nearly untraceable muscle paralyzer used in surgery, which she would have had access to um, easily because of her job. So, um, a state medical examiner concludes Rico was probably poisoned with this lovely drug, commonly used in surgery to help doctors administer breathing tubes and relax patients' muscles. It's just, you know, once you add some dose that she probably knew how much that was, you know, it knocks the guy out dead. So a paralyzer... Huh? Ooh, it paralyzes the diaphragm and stops the subject's breathing, producing fatal brain damage within four minutes if the subject doesn't receive help to breathe. That is... Okay, on a second note, that is dangerous to use in surgery as well. How can you guarantee that? Oh, I don't understand. Okay, I am not even going to try to explain this, but yeah, this is just dangerous. So yeah, she injects him with this and puts the fire up. Of course, he can't breathe, will not be able to breathe. Ah, this is just now frustrating me because I don't fully understand it, but I understand there's some creepy going on. The Yi examiner says the drug is processed rapidly by the body and can be undetectable in a matter of minutes. Lovely, great, give us exact names and where we can supply ourselves with this murder weapon. Why don't you? Why do they even have to say what muscle tranquilizer it is? I swear people give, like, media and everybody gives everybody plenty of sources to just commit crime. So, no, my, my, my notes on this are the type of crime where you want to burn your husband but don't want any property damage claims. What am I saying? just because of the fire you get me and the and the bed but she didn't damage the whole room yeah yeah good job good job tap on the shoulder right so um steven was taking antidepressants and muscle relaxers which the autopsy detected so the muscle relaxants steven was taking 
another long ass name, warns against taking the drug with antidepressants or alcohol. He apparently did both. Or if you're just listening to the same thing I'm listening to, which is my great voice, God, God help me. Okay, um, if you are yeah listening to what I'm listening to, basically she kind of tried to portray her husband in a very, very shady way just before his death. So, um, in different reenactments, which are there are multiple ones, there one, there's Forensic Files one, there's one with a show named Snapped. Guess what that show is about? Uh, so in different reenactments we see her lighting the bed on fire by making sure the cigarette butt lights up Playboy placed under the bed. So if it was that, or if it was just her actually even saying that, hey, her husband was smoking, which I got another family member, like, confirmed that he wasn't a smoker, or that she was like, yep, he was drunk, he was drinking, I was, you know, supplying the booze. She just wanted to portray her husband as a bad guy in the last moments of his life. Quick background check on this woman. So a few months before the crime, these are the conversations she had with her, her co-workers. Again, another fantastic Forensic Files reincarnation, just... That's not reincarnation, it's not a word. I can never freaking remember what the actual word is. Okay, reconstruction of events, whatever. So, she apparently spoke with his co-worker and offered them 50k to have their husband killed. So again, they testified to this in court, right? So another reading reconstruction, because they had this conversation apparently in the kitchen. So the co-worker is just there like opening the fridge and she's just saying it as a joke. It's just, just watch that forensic files. It's just so worthy. Now on to their actual background check, which is, um, well, how they met and their childhoods. So um, we are going 10 plus years ago, which if my math is doing me right, they have been married for about eight. So this is when they met at college, so at Penn State, um, and when they have actually married. So they had a beautiful daughter, Anna, and a brand new home in the suburb of Laurel. Sorry, how the fuck do you name anything? Laurel, Laurel is a name for a person, you know, like on the, the how to get away with murder. Um, the good part about all of this, actually, is that that child has actually been spared of a lot of media attention, which is really odd, for, especially for cases well, parents are kind of going to get divorced, but then again, um, where well, the dad is dead and then the mom is going to prison. So yeah, so at least good job on that. I haven't found much on the child, so that's over there. You know, a positive sort of spark of light in this story. So Kimberly and Steve were introduced to each other by friends. Both were late bloomers and never got serious girlfriends or boyfriends. Um, now, what this article says it's just, it's just beyond me. It's just how people consider women and still consider women. A good marriage was not something Kimberly ever thought she would have. Kimberly has suffered a traumatic trauma. Okay, so she had like some trauma in her childhood, which they don't specify much on, which again is um, really interesting to understand. So when people usually, when killers only commit one crime, how little of the childhood is actually known versus when it's a serial killer and how every single aspect of it is dissected for us to actually understand the motive. Here they're like, well, her actually her dad kind of abused her but then, you know, so this is my, this might be a repeated cycle within families. Like, what? There is nothing about it. And there's apparently a book on this woman as well. Oh, it's just... And then, you know, she was used to the drama of an unhappy childhood. I, I just don't understand why there's not much on this. So she had a job as a surgical technician at Silver Springs. And Steve worked as a screenskeeper at the golf course. Okay. Now even you know where this is gonna go. That they didn't have the same interests. She was obviously um, overachiever as in she wanted to be friends with all the, you know, cool people in town. The popular girl, somebody with a status, whereas Steve was not the same. I am not a relationship advisor, another disclaimer point. But I can definitely tell you that 
if two people have completely different interests, which are to the core of them important, they should have they should have just they should have just ended in divorce. Yeah, that's my professional opinion, of course. <laughs> Stay. Oh, the next line is beautiful. Women frequently gravitate towards a nurturing field. Uh, no, please. Why? Because they can only stay at home and nurture their kids. So to wrap up that background part, so they started, their marriage was already in shit after, you know, a couple of years. And they started seeing a marriage counselor. And then it surfaces that Kim actually had an affair during that time, so just before the murder, with a military man. Again, not much that I could find on the affair, except that, yeah, it was with the military man. I mean, once I read that, I was like, okay, at least, you know, they are protecting that part. Because he is part of the military, you can't just actually probably say his name legally. But, yeah, so Stephen was all there, you know, normal guy, trying to actually save this marriage. So this is a story where we clearly don't have as much about the background as we do with serial killers, as I said. So it's something we notice again and again as the press tries to justify the isolated murders as motivated by one single motive, without shedding enough light on the childhood of the perp. What, what would be that motive, Maya? Let me know what you think in our community groups or, um, or email motivepod at gmail.com. But I genuinely think she was done. She was done with this marriage. But more importantly that she, that she was done is, well, okay, I'm basing this on the fact that she wasn't getting divorced, she was not getting divorced, and she wasn't ending her affair, right? So this was her attempt, because obviously in, in the mind of the killer they actually get away with it, right? So she is innocent, everything, life goes on, and you know, everybody is just like, oh, poor widow. Okay, I think that there's a lot of pride and shame involved here, and both of those, pride mostly, is the motive. Yeah, you can disagree, but based on, yeah, taking everything into account, I think a lot of people, and why a lot of people, again, don't either get divorced, um, or, you know, don't stop the affair, is because one or the other might actually come to light, and then some people just need to listen to some Brene Brown, and, you know, not actually commit murder, and, yeah, face vulnerabilities or just get divorced and get on with it ah cause now nobody pities you when you're in prison and everybody thinks you are guilty what the public actually thinks and the press actually thinks is either it's for the money mostly obviously people mostly think it's for the money cause insurance was worth 40k which I googled it's about not 40k 400k it's actually killed for 40k. Still, some people would. So the insurance was worth 400k, which in today's money is a 600,000 dollars. Are we in the US? Yeah, dollars. Okay. Or the last comment I had was she just snapped. You know, the TV show reference is because apparently. That happens a lot, and that actually ends up being the motive for a lot of people who only kill one time. People just don't comprehend the reasons with, behind it. And then they're just like, well, it was just to yeah, totally normal person, lovely person, but they had just snapped. Which I don't believe, because there's a lot of preparations going on here. A lot of comments made with the co-workers. Like, there is some premeditation here sorry to say, plus, because of what I was saying, she wasn't getting divorced, wasn't really terminating the affair, everything was just at a standstill, I genuinely think she just killed because she thought she would get away with it and will continue her life, you know, as her normal, proud self. Nothing had changed. No changes. So let me know what you think, guys. And of course, where there's forensic files, there are some rapid fire facts. When I do this research, there's a few. So, Snapped has a Wikipedia page, but him, Rico, doesn't. I mean, come on, you actually... I actually appreciate this, because, you know, there are some Wikipedia pages where you're like, why are you playing to this person's ego? Okay, if you were to create mine, that would be completely fine. Just put some actual 
you know, facts that are accurate about me. But yeah, this is actually the happy fact about this research. Not so happy because Snap is not the best show, but still. Yeah, I'm glad that hey, there are murderers there that haven't been given a Wikipedia page. We're not worshipping all over them. Um, Game of Thrones was withheld from her in prison because it continued maps. Contained maps, not continued maps. I'm blind even with my glasses on. Okay, so this comes from a genius a blog post, guys. You need to check this blog post out. So, it's a blog post by her best friend. Well, teenagehood best, best friend, childhood best friend, who she just starts. I was the best friend of a murderer, la di da di da. Um, it has this amazing picture with like a very 80s hairstyles, <sighs> nothing beats 80s and like 70s hairstyles, man. And basically, so she just, <laughs> this is so brilliant just because this woman goes to visit her in prison and does what every single one of us would do. She's like, just to complete disregard for like her actual friend. Like I'm not saying everybody would have this. But she has just complete disregard for her friend's well-being. Finding out about the motive about anybody else would actually want to know about. And she just goes in and just observes what happens and like asks the weird facts. It's like, hey, what is contraband? What do they keep away from you? So apparently she wants to read Game of Thrones and she can't because it contains maps, which was a really fun fact to know about. So basically, if you are in prison in the US, you cannot read anything that has maps because, you know, people have seen prison break. Um, and then pictures of her daughter's wedding reception as well were we held, um, withheld because alcoholic drinks were shown. Alcohol is forbidden. Okay, this is the part where I'm like, this is now too much. So what? But I mean, it's not like alcohol jumps out of the image and, you know, gets to her cell. Oh, it's just, yeah. Okay, so Game of Thrones, understandable. This, not so much. Okay, so this blog. The blog is called The Dolly Mama. It's on WordPress. Kim, a prisoner on the outside, but not on the inside. Okay, so these are the facts. Are you, are you guys ready? So these are some rapid fire facts that her friend has asked her about and clearly shared on this blog. So she has to buy her own toiletries. Tide Pods are $6.99 for a small box. Here's to everybody, future perspective. Criminals, get on it. You know how much, you know, when you menstruate, how much you're gonna pay for it. She lives in the most privileged section of the prison because of good behavior. She has a TV with an old antenna and a DVD player. She has seen reruns of the TV shows where she is featured countless times. Again, who lets these prisoners feed their ego by letting them watch TV shows that show their face? Sorry, not the best. The sources for this podcast have been Generation Y podcast episodes, Red Podcast Solid Just Facts, Just Straight Through to the Truth, Forensic Files, Snapped, The Marshall Project, again, great website to find stuff about crazy killers, WordPress blog, Martinis and Murder podcast, and of course our Dolly Mama. Credit to Dolly Mama, has she ever been credited before as a podcast source? I don't know, but girl, keep up the good work. So again, guys, thank you so much for, you know, committing to me, <laughs> committing to me. Sorry, the neighbors are arguing downstairs. I don't know what the fuck is actually happening. And can you hear this? So just uh, so many distractions. Plus I have been recording like the whole day. And yeah, then now I have to research for another podcast episode. You know, you know how the life goes. So thanks again for supporting me, for paying for, you know, extra crime content. I will probably have a compilation on my own burps when I finish this. But yeah, I will, guys, compile some bloopers for you as well, maybe to release this month. But then definitely another extra episode coming in for you in February. So, you know, peace out. Um, send me your motives. Or don't, you know, keep your conspiracy theories yourself. Whatever, guys, what, what is happening in this neighborhood? I don't even live in the hood. 
I live in Zone 4 London. This is unacceptable. It was a really strange if I actually can't hear it, which I suspect you can because this is a microphone and not fucking Auschwitz. Okay, it's it's time, yeah. I'm mentioning Nazi Germany, it's time for this to end. Sorry guys. Love ya and keep doing what you're doing and keep sharing motives and keep making this world a better place. So one motive at a time. Having a goat's cheese break here. What are you doing? Mm, mm, mm. Vocal cords preparation. <laughs> what you need vocal cords for, my fuck's sake? Huh? It's December 1995. A young woman, Diana Melnick, disappeared from Vancouver's downtown east side. Only for her pink fingerprints to be found. <laughs> Brief history on the farm. I know I said I'm not going to speak about it, but uh, it's just the important bit, right? It's just the history of the farm that kind of gives the history of the family. So, in 1905, 52 years after the first Europeans settled in the area that is now called Poco. Really? Oh, God, I can't deal with these names. Uh. So that's it when it comes to the episode and the motive. Of course, you can I am email me to motivepod at gmail.com and with any, well, with feedback on this episode and, you know, what do you think the motives behind Picton were, but also with any motives behind any, you know, serial killers that you think might be debatable, you know conspiracy theories probably but yeah don't don't, don't send me stuff like oj oh, didn't do it and it was actually i don't know his neighbor or you know the motive for ed Gein is because he actually <laughs> didn't love his mom <laughs> ah jokes this is so sad <laughs> man paper straws are the worst I can't suck anything out of this thing eats your host maya and this is motive. Are you ready to learn, guys? Oh, I need to switch off intercom, sorry. This story ends on bank holiday in August 2008. The Fosters returned from a barbecue to their home to get some peace and quiet before returning to work after bank holiday day. This doesn't make any sense! <laughs> Moving on, so other details are that he shot them, as I mentioned, between 12 and 13 a.m. Is this a mafia thing? No, ignore me. Yeah. <laughs> so he picks up the victim. Again, my notes like it's just all over the place. It's just the professional writer here. Years prior to this, he was ev- ev- evicted. <coughs> okay. <laughs> the way I just say motive is just great. This is my wedding ring, wedding banging on the table. Um, Somebody is using combining. Because <laughs> philia is from. Philia is Greek, right? And then pube is pube. <sighs> the linguist. Okay. Uh, here. Uh, <laughs> Don't do crimes, but if you, if you, you know, decide one day, hey. I need to rob something. Round up the numbers. Don't like this person has no. You just okay. What he told the police while they were handcuffing handcuffing him. <laughs> a first sized hole. A fist sized hole. Okay, this is definitely copy paste. <laughs> a fist sized hole. <laughs> definitely copy paste here. Okay. This brought the end of Toy Box Killer's 45 year old. <laughs> From David Parker. What the fuck is happening? Why is it not recording? There it is. <laughs> so professional. <laughs> okay. So, only 30 minutes into the journey, so the vehicle stopped in a remote area. No, actually, I skipped a fucking part. <laughs> this, is, this, this happens. But yeah, somebody email me, yeah? Bampod at gmail.com. Um, no, no. Podbam at gmail.com. Explain, um, it is always 
the weirdest thing actually starting the re- like pressing the record button and starting the podcast i have no idea why but that is always like it, it's just so natural right after that but then just before just before you click that record you're like uh, uh, what's my intro <laughs> how do i start this welcome to march fuckers i know how to start this where is my uh, my beautiful tweet? My beautiful, uh, beautiful tweet. <clears throat> don't I? Why don't we? Why don't we? <laughs> okay, this is not going into the episode, definitely. It's the cousin story, okay? So, long story short, basically, is like, I think this is what counts as a second cousin, right? So it's not like my dad's aunt's son, but my dad's cousin's son, right? So is that second or third or whatever? Anyways, the <laughs> lineage doesn't matter, okay? So, this kid um used to obviously play with me and my bro back home. So I think I was 10, so my bro was like five and a half, six. Um, and what happened? It's just like, during that day, I just was sort of like observing the two of them play on the like on the carpet in the living room. And I was just like, huh, my cousin is like really nice looking. He has some potential. And then I looked towards my brother and I was like, he also has, you know, a way with uh, kids. And at that same instant, I was like, this is wrong. This is ro- it's really wrong to have these <laughs> fucking thoughts. And then, yeah, I beat myself up that a whole day. And then I realized, yeah, there's something okay with me. Because I'm not into incest. That's the story, okay? That's the fucking plot. Now, drop it. Don't be like, ooh, Maya is the cousin lover. No. <laughs> and that was that for that case. Yeah. <laughs> I am here drinking, like, a freaking... What's it called? Coke Zero. Do you know? Do you know? Definitely. Okay. This... Cut this out. <laughs> this out from the main tape my um yeah do you think like have you ever done the coke test i still haven't but i'm very much pretty sure that i would be able to differentiate between like full sugar coke zero and diet coke diet coke is just the worst <laughs> so when i go to the markets i ask for the black coke if it's like that kind of situation <laughs> what kind of situation but you get what i mean they're like oh what coke do you want i say i want black coke anyways <laughs> anyway yeah, so what I wanted to say, which doesn't have anything to do with the story, that's why I edit it out and leave it for like bloopers or some shit, is um, there was this colleague that I used to work with, just drank coke, like I have never seen bitch drink water during that shift. And it's not that, everybody was kind of like on her case, they were like, what are you doing? And then what I asked, I was like, okay, cool, so, you know, during the night, like, do you have water next to your bed? And... Um, no, she said she had coke next to her bed. I was just, this is just wrong. <laughs> this bitch is taking coke the same way people drink water. And um, yeah, that was one of the one of the many things that yeah I get reminded of when I see a bottle of coke. And that's why I limit myself to it, okay? Okay, you don't need that much sugar, okay? Listen to me. Listen, do you hear this? Do you want to be this? <laughs> God. Okay, much ado about nothing. I had a Shakespearean thing. <laughs> So there was, I lived with a bunch of Italians, and I don't know for what reason, but they really fucking love Shakespeare. So they, like, brought me for the first time to Shakespeare's Globe to see the live play. Fucking hated every single minute of it, okay? I'm not a Shakespeare person. It's just the language, and it's just... uh, And I love Agatha Christie, for example, okay? That's my kind of shit. I'm just really not into Shakespeare, so, like, when we... First of all, I left. I just left them all there. I was like, yeah, they're enjoying it. I'm not. I'm going to go home. And then, like, when they, when they came back home, I was like, fuck Shakespeare. And I was like, Maya, you don't understand. Like, he was basically the inventor of English language. I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like, fuck Shakespeare. Why did he speak like that? Like, why do we have to write essays now in that way? And then when I go to actually work in customer service, they're like, no, no, no. You need to lose use colloquial language. And this is how we speak. This is it. The message, the moral of this story is fuck William Shakespeare. <laughs> well, that was intense and uh, very easy to compile, so hope you enjoy these bloopers, guys. <laughs> you know, and uh, keep making the world a better place. One more day at a time. Bye!